So let's talk about shacked hand cards today. There's a giant variety and sometimes it can be overwhelming to decide which ones you want to choose. Um, so we'll just go through all the choices and um, if you have a shop that's nearby that sells them, it's the best thing to do is go and see if you can try them out. So um, the first ones that I usually recommend people start with are um, the ones that say 72. What that means is they're 72 teeth per inch. Um, these are great all around cards. They'll do fine wools, they'll do coarse wools, they'll do whatever you want. So if you're gonna start with hand cards, these are nice because they're very versatile. Um, so there's 72. There are these uh, 112 teeth per inch. The uh, teeth are a little bit finer, set closer together. These are nice for medium to fine wools. The um, coarse wools, not, I don't know, they're not the best. But um, if you do medium to fine wools most of the time, this is the place you want to be. If you have a hard time with hand strength, but you still want to use hand cards, there are these um, nice little mini cards. These also come in flat or curved. Um, the other thing that's nice about these is if you go to um, workshops. These are great to take to workshops because it's just a lot less bulk. You can do everything that you're being taught in class. You use them exactly the same way. It's just smaller and lighter. And um, these are 208. 208 teeth per inch. You can see how much closer these teeth are set. If you want to make poonies with really fine um, fibers like cashmere, these are awesome. If you want to, if you're doing a lot of cotton, also awesome. This is, that's what you want to do. Um, I don't do a lot of wool with these, just the, the teeth are set way too close together and it makes me cry to do that. And finally, this little baby. These come only in one size, flat back. This comes as a single. Everything else I've talked about comes as a pair, and this is a flick card. So let me show you how to use a flick card first, and then I'll show you my card carding method. So when we're flick carding, you always want to protect your lap protect your clothing. Um, the, t the teeth on these things are a little bit sharp and you can ruin a pair of jeans in no time. A piece of canvas is nice. This is just a canvas bag. Um, also a piece of leather. A lot of people like a piece of leather on their leg. Um, I just always have a spinning apron and I like a spinning apron because it has pockets and I can put my oil in there and then, you know, sometimes a little lock gets and I stick it in there so my pockets get full really fast. But an apron works well too. And it doesn't slide off my lap. So we're gonna flick. We'll just lay that there. Today, I'm using some washed Montedale wool. If you're gonna flick, you want something that has a little bit of length. It doesn't have to be super long, um, but you know, I like something more than two inches because there ha you have to be able to hold on to the wool without killing your hands and, you know, drawing blood. So there's two ways to use the flick. And I, I'll show you um, one way and then I'll show you my favorite way. So the first way is to take your lock, hold it in your fingers. See how I'm holding closer to the cut end? or closer to one end. I always start flicking with the tip and then I do the cut end just so I remember which end I'm, I'm doing because usually when I'm flicking, I wanna keep everything aligned with the same end. And so I start with the right the tip and then I go to the cut end. That's just the way I do it. So take your lock and then take your flick and just tap and see how the wool is starting to open up. But you can also see 
that this takes a little bit of time. Turn it over, tap, tap, tap. It's still not really open. So my favorite way to do it, a little bit more efficient, um, is I take the lock, put a twist, not in the center, but toward one end, and then I just pull the flick through and see how much faster that opened that. Turn it over, pull the flick through. The reason I put a twist in the middle is so that a lot of fibers don't just kind of come out. So the waste that you're getting here are the short fibers, the weak fibers, the ones that you want to get rid of rather than accidentally losing them. Then I take my lock, turn it around, put that twist back in, do the same thing on the other end. There's the waste. This is stuff I throw away. I don't use it for anything else. I just throw it away because it's waste. Some people do like to stuff things with it. Some people like to card it and use it for something else. I prefer not to. So now we have our lock. Let the twist come out of the center. Squidgy, squidgy, squidgy. And you have a nice flicked lock. I usually spin from the cut end and I know that this is the cut end because I did it second. And then if I'm gonna do a whole bunch of flicking at the same time, I lay all my locks so everything's aligned. If I'm not gonna spin them right away, um, sometimes I'll put them in a, like a cardboard shoe box with an arrow or with one side labeled that says it's the cut end or the tip so that you don't lose track of what you're doing. So there's flicking. So let's talk about carding. This is my method. I've taken carding classes from a whole bunch of people. Um, at first, when I started to learn how to card, I was not awesome at it. And so I kept taking classes until I found some teachers um, that were using a method that was good for me. And actually, this is sort of a combination, little bits taken from lots of people. And this is the way I do it. This is not the only way to card. Do not even think that this is the only way to card. If my method isn't working for you, Interweave has a great video. It's called How to Card Wool, Four Spinners, Four Techniques. And so it's four different um, teachers who are teaching you their method to card. And they're all four completely different methods. You can watch them, try them, combine the techniques that they're using, and come up with something that works for you. How to hold the hand cards, how you're gonna move the cards. All these things will make carding easier. But don't give up after the first try and say carding just isn't for you because um, my hand carding is much faster than I can ever card a fleece on the drum carder. So, um, but that's just because of practice. So, let me show you my method. Um, I like to put the hand card on my leg to load it, and um, that's one of the nice things about the curve back cards, it just kind of sits there. We're back to using the Montadale wool. One thing to keep in mind with, um, with processing fleeces, and I didn't say this with the flick carding, but it's the same thing. More is never better. Um, so I'm not going to overload my cards because the more you put on there, then the more passes you need to open it up, and it doesn't end up being faster. It actually slows you down. So I'll show you how much I put on. So I don't like to load past the two-thirds mark on the card. I come, put the wool. It's just, you know, kind of a handful. Put my hand down on top and pull across and down a little bit so that the wool goes into the teeth. Across and down. The same thing all the way across. Now some of these places, it looks like it's sitting really far on top of the teeth, but it's really, it's just fluffy wool and you can easily see the teeth through there. If you can't see the teeth or feel them easily, it, you have way too much wool on your cards. If you're having trouble with your hand carding technique, try using half of the amount of wool because start with less and then add little bits more until 
you find out what's uncomfortable and then you'll know how much to put on. So I'm right-handed, so I'm gonna be moving my right hand the most. So I call this my stationary card, even though it's not actually stationary. I hold it like this. My thumb comes across the handle. That's why I love these shacked cards because they have this wide, flat bit at the where the body of the card is. And then on the back, my fingers come, they're like a little table holding the card, just kind of. So the card is balanced there. I don't care about this part of the handle. I'm, I never hold it by that. But this way, all of the weight of the card is in my hand, rather than if you're holding it like this, this can hurt your wrists after a while. This is very comfortable to card for a very long time. The other card I take in my hand, and the way I hold it is my fingers, these two fingers come up onto the body of the card, and then the fatty part of my thumb sits on the back of the card there. So again, the, the hand card is very balanced. And so um, I've carded a couple of pounds of wool in a couple of hours and I was not tired because of the way I'm balancing the cards in my hands and I'm not letting the weight of the cards be all out from my arms. Okay, so here I'm going to start in here. Bring my, bring my moving card down into the wool, but not that close. See how I'm barely even grabbing the ends of this wool? Flip up to 90 degrees and pull out. I'm gonna move in just a little bit, flip up to 90 degrees and pull out. Now I'm holding these kind of up so you can see what's happening. Usually I card down in my lap a little bit more because it's a lot easier than holding your card, your arms out from your body. This is very tiring. Down here, and my elbows are at my sides, and it's really comfortable. So I'm gonna come in, flip up, and pull out. And now, I'm to the point where my teeth are gonna mesh, and that means I'm gonna move both of the cards. And pull out, and see how the the wool is transferring from one card to the other. Now I'm coming back to get the rest of this wool. Mesh the teeth together, flip and pull. See, this card is clean, all the wool's over here. Now, at this point, you can switch hands and do the exact same thing over again. If you look at this card, you see there's a whole bunch of locks that are still not open and you need to do at least one more pass. With raw wool, I find you need to do two or three passes. If you're carding um, top, comb top, because you want a wool in prep, uh, one pass is usually plenty, unless you're blending, which we'll talk about in a minute. So if you don't want to switch hands, if I do switch hands, I'm going to do the exact same thing until the locks are open. If you don't want to switch hands, you're going to do the same thing except kind of upside down. So I'm bringing these together. Flip this one and pull. Bring them together. Bring them together until all the fibers transferred. Now, you can see there's still a couple of bits that need to be opened up, so I'm going to do one more pass. So, come down. Remember to come to the 90 degrees because that helps. Also, another thing to keep in mind is I'm not coming to the 90 degrees and pulling down. I'm at 90 degrees and I'm sort of coming up a little bit. I'm pulling the wool out of the teeth at an upward angle. So don't, don't try to be like, you know, pulling down because that's going to make it really difficult. Everything's passed. Looks pretty good to me. And so now I'm going to make a roll egg. I just... There's some magical way to make a roll egg with the two hand cards. It's not my specialty. So I just hold the card like this, sort of between my knees. Come in like this, start rolling the fiber toward you. And then I like to roll it on the teeth. And so that makes a really nice, sort of dense roll egg, but not really dense, but Rolling it in the teeth will hold it together a little bit better. 
and that's good. So, if you want to blend, it's exactly the same thing. Um, if you want to get a consistent blend over, you know, a whole bunch of wool, then you're going to do some measuring, right? You're going to measure out, um, say you have a pound, you need a pound of wool, and you're going to blend uh, two colors. Half of it's going to be one color, half of it's going to be the other color. What I usually do is I... <laughs> I am not very precise about it because I like a little bit of changeable color in my yarn because when you knit with it or weave with it or whatever, you get some kind of interest in the color. So I don't do everything so it's really beautifully blended. But what I do is I will take all of one color and make bats. Okay, so I'm just gonna make a whole bunch of bats. So let me show you what I mean by that. This is my one color I'm going to use to blend and the other color is going to be white because I want to lighten this up a little bit. So if I do that, I'm going to put this on the hand card. And I'm just going to go one pass from one card to the other. There's the fiber. And I'm just going to remove this. We're pretending like um, I weighed any of this out. So there's my first bat. Um, actually, wait, let's make two. Usually after you practice a little while, you'll start to know approximately how much you put on a hand card at the same time, at one time. So um, weighing it really doesn't become that important because you get a feel for it. So there's my second bat. See that? Now let's do two white bats. So if you were going to do a pound of fiber, a half a pound of each color, you would do this with um, all of the fiber that you want to make. You're going to make bats out of the solid colors. And then, after you have all your bats made, you're going to take half of a blue bat and put it on your card. But you want to spread it evenly over the whole card. And then half of a white bat and spread that evenly over your card. Then take your other card and begin to blend. This is where you're going to make some judgment calls. How much do you want them to be blended? Um, the more passes you do, the more blended they'll become. So you need to decide if you want to have a lot of color interest or a very um, 
homogenized color. But see, I can keep doing this back and forth. There's a point where you want to stop, though, because with finer wools, um, like Cormo or Merino, doing too many passes can add little bumps called neps um, that will, when you go to spin them, make your yarn more in inconsistent. So you want to make sure, do some sampling before you get into your whole um, blending to make sure that the wool that you're using isn't going to get all neppy. But that is pretty blended, and that was about, I think that was five passes. And then you can take it off. Just like that. And so you would do that with, with all of your wool half and half if you want a 50-50 blend. If you have three colors, then you just weigh those out, and then what you're going to do is take a third of a bat, a third of a bat, a third of a bat, and do the exact same thing. So you don't need really expensive tools to get really beautifully blended fiber.